This is Space Time, Series 24, Episode 110. Coming up on Space Time, a landing site chosen for NASA's new Viper lunar rover, a new study suggests Mars was simply too small to ever retain lots of water, and discovery of a new binary white dwarf system. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA has selected the western edge of Nobile Crater at the Moon's South Pole as the preferred landing site for its Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, or VIPER, mission slated for launch in 2023. VIPER is part of the Artemis program and is designed to confirm the presence of water ice just below the surface on the permanently shadowed floors of polar craters where sunlight never reaches. This water could be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen for use as rocket fuel for future missions to Mars and beyond. Nobile Crater was chosen because it's one of the coldest places in the solar system. No spacecraft has ever landed there before, and it's only ever been explored from orbit using remote sensing instruments. The Viper mission will explore the impact crater to discover how frozen water reached the Moon in the first place, how it's remained preserved for billions of years how it escapes, and where it goes. Unlike the rovers used on Mars, which are somewhat autonomous, the 430 kilogram Viper will be piloted in near real time. That's because the 385,000 kilometre distance between the Earth and the Moon is a lot shorter than the distance to Mars, and so commands only take 1.3 light seconds to reach it. The golf cart size four-wheel Viper will also be faster than its Martian counterparts, with a top speed of 0.8 kilometres per hour. It will be solar-powered and come with at least 50 hours of battery life, and it will be built to withstand the extreme temperatures it will have to endure on the Moon. Another neat feature is its ability to crab walk sideways, so its solar panels can always keep pointing towards the Sun in order to maintain charge. Viper will launch on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket for delivery to the Moon by Astrobotics Griffin Lander. Once on the lunar surface, Viper will provide ground truth measurements for the presence of water and other resources at the Moon's South Pole. The landing site will allow Viper to visit at least six locations of scientific interest during the 100-day mission duration, covering an area of some 93 square kilometres. As Viper reaches each place of interest, it'll analyse drill core samples taken from different depths and temperatures in order to help scientists better predict where water ice may be present on the Moon in similar terrain. All this will allow scientists to develop a global resource map of the Moon for use by future manned missions. This report from NASA TV. The future of human space exploration is being driven by what we can discover and accomplish on the Moon. And with NASA's confirmation of ice existing at the lunar south pole, the critical task of finding and mapping where water exists, what form it is in, and where it came from can now begin. Leading us on that journey will be NASA's first mobile robotic mission on the Moon, known as VIPER, the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. It will be delivered to the Nobile region of the South Pole as part of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative. As the first ever resource mapping mission on the surface of another celestial body, Viper will roam the surface equipped with three science instruments and a drill to detect and analyze various lunar soil environments at a range of depths and temperatures. The rover will venture into permanently shadowed craters, some of the coldest spots in the solar system, where ice reserves have been preserved for billions of years. NASA had four critical parameters when choosing a landing site for Viper. Available sunlight, Earth visibility for communications from the Moon to the Earth, data showing the potential presence of water and other resources, and terrain that is well suited for Viper to navigate. Once on the surface, Viper's mission will last 100 days and cover between 10 to 15 miles. And while a baseline traverse route through the Nobile region has been identified for the rover, the scientific discoveries Viper makes along the way 
will actually influence where the mission team sends it next, so its planned route will most likely change. During its travels, Viper will visit at least six locations where data suggests ice could be found. By helping determine the locations of where water and other resources exist, Viper's findings will help pave the way for future landing sites under NASA's Artemis program. The prospects of achieving a long-term human presence on our moon never look so bright. This is space time. Still to come, new research suggests a fundamental reason Mars has no water is that it's too small to hold on to large amounts of water and discovery of a new binary white dwarf system. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Scientists have found ample evidence for the past existence of liquid water on Mars. But of course, there's no significant liquid water on the red planet today. Now, new research suggests a fundamental reason is that Mars may simply be too small to hold on to large amounts of liquid water. Scientists have proposed many possible explanations why a once warm, wet world has become the freeze-dried desert the red planet is today. The most popular of these is the weakening of the Martian magnetic field as the planet cooled down and its core solidified. Without a protective magnetic field, the solar wind has steadily eroded the once thick Martian atmosphere. Eventually, the atmosphere was so thin, it allowed the water to sublimate directly into a gas and evaporate away into space. However, a new study reported in PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, suggests a more fundamental reason why today's Mars looks so drastically different from a planet like Earth. The study's lead author, Kun Wang, from Washington University in St. Louis, says the fate of Mars was decided from the very beginning. He says there's likely a threshold on the size requirements of rocky planets in order to retain enough water to enable habitability and plate tectonics to take place, with the necessary mass exceeding that of Mars. Wang and colleagues have used stable isotopes of the element potassium to estimate the presence, distribution and abundance of volatile elements on different planetary bodies. Potassium is moderately volatile, and the authors could use it as a tracer for more volatile elements and compounds, such as water. This is a relatively new method that diverges from previous attempts to use potassium to thorium ratios generated by remote sensing and chemical analysis to determine the amount of volatiles Mars once had. To reach their findings, the authors measured the potassium isotope compositions of 20 previously confirmed Martian meteorites, each selected to be representative of the bulk silicate composition of the red planet. They determined that Mars lost more potassium and other volatiles than the Earth during its formation, but at the same time it retained more of these volatiles than the Moon or the asteroid Vesta, two much smaller and drier bodies than either the Earth or Mars. The authors found a well-defined correlation between the size of a body and its potassium isotopic composition. Of course, right now, Martian meteorites are the only samples of the red planet available to study in order to determine the chemical makeup of the bog Mars. And these Martian meteorites have ages varying from several hundred million to four billion years, thereby providing a good record of Mars's volatile evolution history. By measuring the isotopes of moderately volatile elements such as potassium, Wei and colleagues could infer the degree of volatile depletion of bulk planets and make comparisons between different solar system bodies. These findings have implications in the search for life on planets beside Mars. That's because liquid water is an essential for life as we know it. Being too close to a host star or too far away can affect the amount of volatiles a planetary body can retain. And so to start with, scientists looking for life beyond Earth are looking for planets in the so-called habitable zone, that area out from a star where the temperature is right for liquid water to form on a planet's surface. And now, scientists can also factor in a size range for planets in order for there to be enough water to develop a habitable surface environment. This is space-time. Still to come, discovery of a binary white dwarf system 
and Taikonauts return home after 90 days on China's new space station. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Astronomers have discovered a double white dwarf star system located just 368 light years away. White dwarfs are the collapse cores of sun like stars. Stars shine by fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores. When they run out of core hydrogen, they contract, eventually increasing core temperature and pressure until it's hot enough to begin fusing helium into carbon and oxygen in the core, with a shell of hydrogen then beginning to burn outside the core. Now this causes the star's outer gaseous envelope to expand, and as it's now further away from the contracted core, this outer envelope also cools down, turning the star into a red giant. Eventually, the star runs out of core helium to fuse, and as it's not massive enough to fuse heavier elements, the star dies. Its bloated outer envelope floats away as a spectacular cloud called a planetary nebula leaving behind its white-hot stellar core exposed as a white dwarf, which will slowly cool over the eons. It's the fate that will befall our sun in about 7 billion years from now. In fact, astronomers estimate about 97% of all stars eventually become white dwarfs. This new white dwarf binary, designated as SDSS J133725.26 plus 3952.37.7, was detected in early data from the 5th generation Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The findings, reported on the pre-press physics website archive.org, will allow scientists to study these objects, whose mergers are believed to produce new white dwarfs of higher masses, or if they're massive enough, they could even trigger a supernova. Initial observations suggest the binary system has a 99-minute orbital period. The primary white dwarf is about 600 million years old, with about half the mass of the Sun and about 0.0141 solar radii. Based on its cooling age, the second white dwarf must be far older, around 1.2 billion years. It has approximately 0.2 solar masses and around 0.02 solar radii. Now, given the secondary star has a larger cooling age, the authors think it was originally the larger of the two stars and ascended the giant branch first, losing mass to its companion. Due to its proximity to Earth and its short period, the system is among the strongest known sources of gravitational waves in the millihertz frequency regime. In fact, the authors say this gravitational wave emission will most likely cause the system's orbital period to contract until eventually the two stars merge, probably in about 220 million years from now. Because of their size, their merger will form a rapidly rotating helium star, which will ultimately end its life as a helium atmosphere white dwarf. This is Space Time. Still to come... Three Chinese Taikonauts return safely to Earth after completing the country's longest ever manned space mission. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Three Taikonauts have returned safely to Earth after completing China's longest ever manned space mission. The crew parachuted down into the Gobi Desert aboard their Shenzhou-12 spacecraft after spending 90 days in orbit setting up the Tianhe core module of Beijing's new Tiangong or Heavenly Palace space station. During their stay on station, the trio unloaded a cargo ship full of supplies which had been docked to the space station, they reconfigured the inside of the module from its original launch to an orbital mode, they undertook two spacewalks to set up equipment outside the space station, and they even conducted several experiments. The mission was China's first manned spaceflight in nearly five years. It was designed to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the ruling Chinese Communist Party on July 1st. Tianhe is expected to operate for at least 10 years and will be joined by two more modules bringing the total mass of the Tiangong space station to 70 tonnes. Meanwhile, the Tianzhu-3 cargo ship has now docked onto the aft port of the Tianhe module. 
The docking took place just seven hours after its launch from the Wangcheng Satellite Launch Center on Henan Island in the South China Sea aboard a Long March 7 rocket. The spacecraft is carrying over six tons of supplies, which will be unloaded by the crew of the Shenzhou 13 spacecraft that was slated to launch on October the 16th. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study suggests if you've already had COVID-19, it's still worth getting the vaccine. A report in the journal Nature looked to see how well the virus was neutralised by antibodies from people who had been vaccinated, people who had been infected, and people who had been both vaccinated and infected. And to really put these antibodies to the test... The authors developed a version of the virus spike protein with 20 specific mutations that made it more likely to escape immune response. Just a minute, isn't that gain-of-function research? Anyway, the authors found that people who were vaccinated or those who had had COVID-19 were no longer able to neutralise the super spike protein. But people who had been both infected and vaccinated had antibodies that could neutralise it. Since it's not ideal to become infected with COVID-19 in the first place, researchers suggest looking at whether or not booster jabs can be created with the same broad response. They also suggest using this highly mutated spike protein to create vaccines that may one day help to broaden the immune response. The World Health Organization says more than 8 million people have been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus, with almost 4.8 million confirmed fatalities and over 230 million people infected since the deadly disease was first spread out of Wuhan, China. A new study shows that the parents of kids with autism tend to have less symmetrical faces than average. The findings by scientists with the Edith Cowan University and the University of Western Australia could provide a better understanding for the genetic factors associated with being on the autism spectrum. Previous research had already shown that kids on the autism spectrum were more likely to have greater facial asymmetry than non-autistic children. The researchers used sophisticated machine learning techniques to analyse some 5,000 points on three-dimensional facial scans of 192 parents of kids on the spectrum and 163 adults with no known history of autism. They found the parents of children on the autism spectrum had more asymmetric faces than other adults of a similar age. The findings reported in the journal Autism Research suggest there could be a link between the genes which affect the likelihood of an individual having a greater facial asymmetry and autism. A new study warns that nearly a quarter of Italian alpine plant species are now threatened by glacial retreat. Scientists from Stanford University reached their conclusions by combining historical records, current surveys and computational models. The authors say many glaciers around the world are predicted to disappear within the next decade and the consequences for plants, animals and societies surrounding them are still uncertain. For years, curry lovers have sworn by the anti-inflammatory properties of turmeric. But its active compound curcumin has long frustrated scientists hoping to validate these claims with clinical studies. The failure of the human body to easily absorb curcumin has been a thorn in the side for medical researchers seeking scientific validation to show that curcumin can treat cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's and many other chronic health conditions. Now, a study reported in the International Journal of Molecular Science has shown that curcumin can be delivered effectively into human cells by way of tiny nanoparticles. Apple has finally released their new iOS 15 operating system. With the details, we're joined by technology editor Alex saharov Wright from ity.com. Yeah, well, it's just been launched uh, and it is available for the iPhone. You've got iPad OS 15 for the iPad. There's Watch OS 8 for the Apple Watch, TV OS 15 for Apple TV, uh, and Mac OS 12 Monterey will come in a month or two when they launch the new Macs. But uh, there's stacks of great features for the iPhone. One, for example, is one we're using right now. When you're on a FaceTime call, as opposed to a, an, an ordinary phone call, you can choose the mic mode. So you can have standard, then you can have voice isolation, where you can have 
like a hairdryer or a blow dryer or some sort of noise in the background, which is being edited out on the fly because it's voice isolation. They're just picking up your voice. Uh, and then there's also like a, a white condenser mic. Yeah. And, and so it means that you can have kids in the background or dogs barking or, you know, someone mowing the lawn next door. And you, or even the fans in your laptop, you know, spinning up whilst you're on a phone call uh, on your phone. And if you're talking to another iPhone user on FaceTime or in another VoIP app that supports it, you won't hear that background noise. You're also able to do FaceTime with Android and Windows users. You have to send them a, an invite link, but it's now a bit more like Zoom to be able to do that. Uh, you can now take photographs of anything with text, like a business card or it could be a phone number or a name in the text of a shop behind you, or you can have images from 10 years ago that you've taken that are in your camera roll. And iOS 15 and iPadOS 15, can, you can now copy and paste that text as though it was actual text, and it's doing live on the fly optical character rec recognition. And then you can copy it into an email or notes or a document. It's very, very handy. You can, um, I mean, for example, if there's something that you can't copy and paste off Facebook because Facebook doesn't let you, you take a photo of it, you know, you take the screenshot, and then <laughs> all the text is available to you in the photo app. Now, you can more easily save photos from uh, your messages. There's cool new emojis. There's new focus mode. So you can choose to have certain apps displaying during work time, certain apps during home time, and uh, you have different apps on the screen. And it's a different way of being able to change your life so that work life and home life doesn't intrude, although in lockdown it does intrude. And the ability to translate a text with the uh, fast translation. So even the, if you've got an iPhone with an Apple Watch or you've got a uh, one of those little air tags, if you have an air tag in your backpack and you walk away from your backpack and you've got the tag in there, it'll say, hey, the last place we saw your backpack was back there where you were. So you get the separation alert. Very, very cool. If you are putting somebody on mute when you're talking to them, you now hear a little and when you, when you unmute, you hear a little uh, So you know if you put somebody on mute because sometimes you do it by accident if you're not paying attention. You can even turn your iPhone into a sound machine. You have rain in the background, water in a stream or ocean. So it's this sort of peaceful nature sounds. If you want to block off the rest of the world, then you can have these sounds to sort of put you into a different mood, as it were. Now, one of the features that was promised that I haven't seen switched on yet is called Conversation Boost. If you have a pair of AirPod Pros, you can then switch on the Conversation Boost and it will pick up the voice of whoever is in front of you, like a, a friend in front of you, and you can use your AirPod Pros as a form of cheap hearing aid. And already, AirPod Pros have the transparency mode, and I've heard of people using transparency mode. They're sort of sitting in a cafe, they turn transparency mode on, and suddenly they realize you can hear what the people at the next table are saying. So the conversation boost is, is sort of that on steroids, but it's not designed to pick up somebody from the next table. But no, no, you know, if, you're, if no. you've got mild hearing loss, it's to, to hear the person clearly, more clearly in front of you. And I know people who are already using their AirPods, both the regular ones and AirPod Pros with the live listen mode, using the microphone of your iPhone as a microphone that, that goes straight to your AirPods. So, look, if you go to the Apple website or already, you can see plenty of information there on iOS 15, iPadOS 15, all the different operating systems. They've been in development for a long time, in use by beta testers for about the last three months. I've been using them for the last three months. There were very few bugs this time around, and the bugs were normally every couple of weeks there was a new beta version. One of the big things for the iPad is the ability to multitask much more easily. There's now a button at the top of the screen that you can tap to bring up a secondary app. You can have two apps side by side and you can have a collection of those apps already side by side open like a browser and a word processor or a um, some music program and then garage band, you know, so you can listen to how other people do music. I mean, you can have various different combinations of apps and so the multitasking is definitely much better. Now, the one last thing I want to talk about this week is CarPlay. If you don't have CarPlay in your car or Android Auto, one of those screens that's on modern cars, then you know you can put your phone on the little internal legal phone holder of some sort. But uh, a, a gadget called Coral Vision gives your car a seven-inch CarPlay screen that you can suction cap to the windscreen. And I've been testing it for the past couple of days, and I've been reading about it, contacted the company in Taiwan that makes them. It's fantastic. When I mean, you get the seven-inch screen, you can see Waze or Google Maps or Apple Maps, speaks your messages to you. I mean, CarPlay has been the car safe interface for an iPhone that's controlled by, well, you can touch certain things, but it's meant to be controlled as much as possible by voice. The unit has a built-in FM transmitter. So, you know, you don't, if your car, it doesn't have Bluetooth, but it's got FM radio and it's got the volume controls on the steering wheel. So this has upgraded my car into a modern car with the CarPlay features. And uh, I've had great fun using this. It's 350 US dollars to get it. And you can take it from car to car. So it's a lot cheaper than pulling the radio out, buying a whole new radio, getting someone to install it. And then it's, you know, if you ever get rid of that car, well, you know, you'd have to pull that out and 
of the old radio back. I mean, this is a portable device. So there's been a lot of iOS news. That device is also Android Auto compatible. I'm going to touch it with Android Auto as well. But uh, Android 12 is coming soon. New Google phones coming soon. It's the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> now, I've noticed that I have iOS 14.8 and <laughs> iOS 15 available for downloads. Do I have to download iOS 14.8? Or if I download iOS 15, would that include the updates in 14.8? It will include the updates from 14.8. And Apple is, in fact, giving you a choice. For the first time, they're saying, hey, maybe you want to stay on iOS 14.8. I mean, I'm glad you asked because I was going to bring this up and I forgot. No, 14.8 is the latest version that came out a week ago, yeah, and it's got the newest security. software updates. Yeah, the security updates. And some people do not want to go to the latest iOS or iPadOS version for a month or two because they'd like to see what bugs are there, like other people to work the bugs out. They might have certain apps that don't work on the newest iOS 15. I mean, I haven't come across any, but I'm sure there are some that are out there. And Apple, I think, will potentially continue you know, to release security updates, if need be, for a while before eventually they'll say, look, okay, well, we're not going to do iOS 14 anymore. You now have to go to iOS 15. But they're giving you the choice. You do not have to update to iOS 15 straight away. You can, If you still haven't updated to iOS 14.8, please do that immediately if you wish to stay on iOS 14. But if you want to go to iOS 15, it's ready and waiting. It's been pretty well tested over the last three months. I'm sure some issue will come out. Everyone will talk about it, but it will be quickly fixed and life will get back to normal. That's Alex Sahara of Royd from ity.com. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 